can you give an outline of what you think has happened? Just, br just real brief outline, basically, of what you think the most important catastrophic events, say, in the past 30, 30,000 years, like a brief, oh, you know, leading up sure. to the Well, in the last 30,000 years, the, the most, uh, the most cri the critically important, I think, uh, and the most powerful event would have been the Younger Dryas, the events around the Younger Dryas, both the inception and the, 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 the ending of the Younger Dryas, yeah. you know, between uh, 11,600, say, in, in broad numbers, 13,000 years ago. But clearly, when we look at, um, you know, the history of the last 30,000 years, what we see is that even going back to, like, say, 26 or 27,000 years ago, we see major changes. I mean, for example, if we start looking at the nomenclature of ice ages in North America, the last late glacial phase was caused, called the Wisconsin Ice Age, and the Wisconsin Ice Age refers to a period of time during which uh, this episode of large scale glaciation took place over North America. Right now, in the older models of this, the Wisconsin Ice Age pretty much was a, a unbroken for at least 100,000 years, uh, maybe much longer than that. However, it became apparent that it was too oversimplified to talk about just the Wisconsin Ice Age. So you had to have like the early Wisconsin, the middle Wisconsin, the late Wisconsin, or the final phase of the, of the Wisconsin Ice Age, which is now usually dated to around 26,000 years. And, and essentially, what that means is that the old model was you had this huge ice mass reaching from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the northern United States up to the Arctic Circle. And for 100,000, 120,000 years, maybe longer, that ice mass may have fluctuated a little bit, but more or less remained intact. Whereas now there's enough evidence to suggest that the ice cap fluctuated much more dramatically than anyone had previously assumed. And that Say, if you go back 30,000 years ago to 35,000 years ago, the ice mass was considerably reduced in scale. Um, it's, not, it's not likely that it was completely gone like it is now, with the, with the exception of Greenland. Greenland's ice is, is inherited from the late, from the was, late Wisconsin. Okay. Um, but the assumption was is that you had this mass, that it was there. It was pretty much intact. It maybe it fluctuated around the edges. But now evidence suggests that it was way more dynamic than that. And, and so it appears that around 26,000 years ago, that was the onset of the, the final phase of, the, of this last great Wisconsin ice age, right? And prior to that, glacier masses were drastically reduced. And then around 26,000 years ago, they began to enlarge quite rapidly. And over the next four to 5,000 years grew to their maximum extent, 6 million cubic miles of ice, swallowing up more than half of North America, right? So then we get now to the late glacial maximum, which is usually considered to have occurred somewhere between 17 or 18,000 years ago, up in about 20 to 22,000. The dates that define the LGM, or late glacial maximum, are, are pretty vague, actually. But if you can think in that period of time, let's say 18 to 21,000 years, late glacial maximum, and then things begin to warm up a bit, and, and this is due to changing geometric relations between the Earth and the Sun, right? We won't get into that without, without backup graphics and diagrams, but at some point in a future podcast, we can get into explaining the Milankovitch uh, processes. Um, anyways, Climate starts warming up, glaciers start shrinking, and while the Wisconsin Ice Age refers to a period of time, then the actual ice masses themselves have a name. There was, because in North America, there were two distinct ice masses, a larger one, a smaller one. The larger one was called the Laurentide Ice sheet and it was basically centered over Hudson Bay and covered all of eastern Canada and northeastern United States and the Midwest. When you get out to the western side of North America, you get into the Cordilleran region reaching from northern uh, Montana, Washington, over the, uh, the, the Rocky Mountains, north up into Alaska, there was a separate secondary ice sheet. It's called the Cordilleran ice sheet. 
So those two great ice masses begin to grow rapidly between 22 and 26,000 years ago. And at the late glacial maximum, apparently they coalesced, they grew together on the, on the plains of Alberta. Basically right now in the area where you would go from Edmonton down to Calgary, Alberta, where the Grimerica boys live, would have been right in that corridor that opened up right during the warming and then closed up again perhaps even during the Younger Dryas cold period. So the Younger Dryas comes along and what happened was it reversed 3,000 years of gradualistic warming that had been causing the ice sheets to shrink and open up that corridor east of the Rocky Mountain front. So here comes the, here comes the Younger Dryas episode and suddenly all of that's reversed, all of that, 3,000 years of gradual, more normal warming is just suddenly undone in a matter of a, a, a year maybe, right? So now the planet plunges back into full glacial cold. And this event, which is now dated at around the middle of 12,830, 840 years ago, saw the final extinction of the great megafauna, sudden melting of large portions of the ice sheet, uh, major climatic fluctuations, and the sudden disappearance of the Clovis culture that was quite prolific in North America. So you have four of these things correlated in time. And then, of course, we now come to the uh, ever-growing mass of evidence for some kind of a cosmic impact event having occurred right at that boundary. The uh, what is called the Balling Alarod. The Balling Alarod was this period of warming, and then it was separated by this boundary from the Younger Dryas. It's at this boundary that we find this black matte layer, which we can talk about um, in another podcast, and we'll, we'll pull up images of it, and we'll go into detail what that, the meaning of that, that black matte layer is that separates these two worlds, the world of the Pleistocene below it and the world of the Holocene above it. What differentiates the world of the Pleistocene from the world of the Holocene is the presence of these gigantic glacier masses over North America and Northwestern Europe and the concomitant climate that was associated with that. Because you have to bear in mind that the climate of the Earth had to have been dramatically different if half of North America had a climate whose only modern analog is the South Pole. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. That's something people should think about. Not, you know, when you want to talk about climate change, how, if we were going to try to do something equivalent today, we would have to basically think of this. Here's a scenario, right? You have a mass of ice that's at least as big, maybe bigger, probably some evidence suggests bigger than the mass of ice that now covers the South Pole. Well, let's suppose that about the time of the building of the pyramids, that ice mass over the South Pole began to melt, and by now it was gone completely. So the whole continent of South America, I'm not South America, but Antarctica, is now free of ice. Maybe, maybe some residual mountain glaciers remain in place, but basically it's free of ice, and now people could go in and begin to colonize. They could begin to farm and grow crops. How would you do that? How would you accomplish that? Well, it, it's pretty bizarre when you think about it because we have, you know, we go back 15,000 to 18,000 years ago, late glacial maximum. Imagine that you take that ice, gigantic ice cap off the South Pole of planet Earth, you lift it up and you take it and you lay it down right over North America. And now you're covering over half of North America with it. So you got the problem of getting from a, a, a climate similar today into a full-blown ice age. Then you got the even more intractable problem, which is getting out of the ice age. And believe me, we have not got that figured out yet. I mean, maybe there's somebody going to claims that, but I don't think there's certainly no consensus about what forces pushed this planet into an ice age and what fully brought us out. Clearly, if there was an impact-related event at the Younger Dryas, that would have had some role to play. But exactly what? I don't know. And I don't know, if, you know, having perused the literature and, and listened to a lot of the scientists, talk to the scientists that are working on this, um, 
yeah, I don't think anybody really would would claim, yeah, I've got it all figured out. Right. So but I think of- we can say this with certainty. Without, without encompassing the cosmic realm, we aren't going to figure it out. Right. Did it involve the sun? I'm thinking that it likely did involve the sun. Did it involve impacts of, of things from space? Yes, I think it probably did involve the impacts of things from space. But the model we have to begin to look at now is to begin to understand that our whole solar system is like a, a machine. It all works together. See, and, and it's not like what happens to Jupiter has no consequences for what happens to Earth or what happens on the sun. Or what happens to the sun doesn't have consequences for what happens on Earth. And I think now this is some of the most interesting and cutting edge and important work I think that's going on now, which is suggesting activity, tectonic activity, which can include both seismic activity and volcanic activity in the Earth itself may somehow be tied in to activity within the sun. You see, so this is, these are some of the kinds of ideas I think that we would be exploring um, in upcoming uh, podcasts, yeah. looking at some of these. And then going back into the archaic or traditional realm for additional insight, because that's another part of this. That's the corollary, I think, of all of this, is that we have inherited this amazing legacy of information. And this information is of direct relevance to us understanding some of these forces because ancestors of ours, people that have walked on this planet before modern people have have experienced these events, have witnessed these things, and have gone to great lengths to preserve um, knowledge and information and insight about these events. And the sad thing is, is that the legacy of of what we have inherited is such a small part of what once existed when you start thinking about the deliberate and the accidental destruction of various traditions, you know, the destruction of great libraries and so forth. But what we do have is amazingly rich and it boggles the mind to think about what, what would occasions be if the library, the great library at Alexandria or at Carthage still existed. You know, when you, when you're talking about destroying 800,000 or a million volumes of ancient knowledge, who knows what could have been in there and what kind of information there may have been about earlier civilizations that are now long forgotten. So anybody who comes along and pedantically says, oh, we know, we've got it all figured out, and we know that there was only Stone Age people back then. No, I, no we cannot say that. We right. cannot say that now I- anymore. 50 years ago, we could say that. But now understanding the dynamic nature of this planet that we inhabit, no, we can't say that anymore. We can't say that there was nothing that we would could have called civilization that existed 20,000 years ago. 